my new sister in Christ, uh, who was baptized on on Thursday night, from what I'm seeing here, uh, and the Church of Edgewood, uh, we'd like to welcome Deanna and Delilah to the church family as they were baptized on Thursday. So, welcome, guys. It's glad to have you here. Congratulations for making that decision. It's a decision I made a long time ago. It's not a good one. Let's remember to uh, to continue to send our letters to to Jason Wilkins. Uh, some uplifting letters and cards to keep him encouraged. Uh, you can find his address in the bulletin. Let's remember uh, uh, Sue Dills and and, and, and team. Uh, who are in Simpsonville, let's get over there and see them or send them some cards as well as they go through their rehabilitation. Let's hope they regain their strength before they can be back with us. Remember Charles, Charles Moses as he's having eye surgery first of the week. Let's keep our, him in our prayers as well. And we also have, uh, I'd also like to let everyone know that on the way to church this morning, uh, we heard that Denise's uncle, Edward Marshall, passed away. He's been battling some kidney illness for quite some time. So let's keep Edwina Marshall and, and her family in our prayers as, as they have lost a dear loved one uh, this morning. We'd like to thank uh, Sister Pam for this month's bulletins. Keep up the good work, Pam. You're doing a great job. And that is... I just like to say uh, this morning, if you can volunteer to prepare the communion for any month or coordinate any meal preparations any month, it would be appreciated. And you can find that that checkout, uh, uh, the sign up sheet in, in the foyer. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take men or women. Anybody who would like to volunteer their time for that would be great. Uh, we, we can always use the help. I think that's about it uh, for the announcements this morning. In this morning's worship service, uh, our song leader will be by uh, Brother Joel Foster. Our scripture reading will be by Brother Barney Miller. Uh, Rusty Mattis will close us in prayer. And if you bow with me and, and pray with me, uh, we'll go to our Heavenly Father uh, to get started. Almighty God and our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be the great and holy name. Your Lord, we come in prayer this morning with love and joy and in our hearts, praising your high holy name, thanking you, Lord, for this beautiful day you have given us and this opportunity we have had to gather here uh, with our brothers and sisters in Christ to, to worship you in spirit and truth. Father, to sing songs of praises unto thee, to gather around the table to remember the great sacrifice given to us by Jesus, and to hear another portion of your true and divine word. We're thankful, Father, for your church, your church both here in Malden and your church worldwide and we, we pray father that the truth will always be taught in your church we're thankful father for our brother dennis and the work that him and vicky do here at the church and we pray that he would have a ready recollection of of the lesson that he has prepared this week that he will be able to deliver it to us in a, in a manner that we can understand and that most importantly that we can apply to our lives your lord we as your children, we know that we need to continue opening up your word, continue to study your word, and continue to apply your word to, to be able to have the countenance that we need to teach others and the countenance we need to let others know of your love for them. We do pray, Father, today for Brother Joel as he leads our song service, that, that we would all lift our voices up unto thee and it would be a sweet savor unto you. We pray, Father, for each and every person who has come here this morning that that you would that they would clear their minds and that they would that you would bless them as they as they enter into this worship service. We pray, Father, for those of our number who are unable to be here this morning, those who are in rehabilitation, those who are sick, Father, those who may be working or traveling. We pray that they would all be able to come back to us and and, and and worship with us uh, at the next point of time. We do pray, Father, for those <coughs> this hour who may be spiritually uh, ill. We pray, pray that they would, something may be said or done in their life, that they would uh, change the error of their ways before it is eternally too late. We're thankful, Father, for our new 
sisters in Christ that we, we were able to get last week. We pray that they would continue to stay on the right track and and, uh, and, and see what your love and, and what this Christian lifestyle can do for them. We do pray at this time, Father, for this great country we live in. We pray for all of our first responders as they continue to to serve us and serve this country. We pray for our military, both here and abroad. We pray that you would keep them safe. And dear Lord, we just pray for this country at this time. We know there's a great fall in the way. We know there's there's a lot of uh, political divide in this country. And we just pray that we we could all continue to look to your word and we could all find common ground. Dear Lord, do you know that we'll always fight for your word? That's just what what Christians do. And, we just pray that as, as our leaders make laws that affect your children, that they would seek your word and your, your guidance before making them, and that she would strike down those that are contrary to your word. We are thankful, Father, once again for this opportunity, and as we continue to go through the further exercise of this service, we, we pray that all that is said and done is according to your will and pleasing in your sight. We pray for forgiveness, Father, when we fall short. And this prayer that we ask today is in the loving name of Christ. Seven three. Four seven three. <laughs> Supper, eight four two, eight four two. Mm -hmm. Our common law for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding.
gather around the table this morning to take of the bread and the fruit of the vine, which represents Jesus' body and his blood that flowed from him. And we do this in remembrance of him. If you would, I'd like to read <clears throat> Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29. And it reads, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Well, now how to prayer for our bread. Kind Heavenly of Father, we thank you for your Son Jesus who went to that cross and hung on it for each and every one of us. We pray as we take this, the bread which represents his body, and we'll take of it in a manner that is pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We'll now continue your prayer for the fruit of the vine. Our kind of Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that we have to partake of this, the fruit of the vine, which represents the shared blood of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May we as Christians partake of this in a manner pleasing in your being. In Christ's name we pray.
That concludes the Lord's Supper. Another part of our worship service is giving back to the Lord as He's gave unto us. If you would, I'd like to read 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. And it reads, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. We'll now have a prayer for our offering. That's right. Father, Full caution with medical years with the Christian laws. Let her and her side sing glad to him. Nine to nine. Nine to nine. <clears throat>
three, eight. One, three, eight. <clears throat> Tempted and tried, we're all made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long, while there are others living about us, never molested, though in the wrong, farther Master, the tempest is raging, the bellows are tossing high. The sky is overshadowed with blackness, no shelter or help is nigh. Carest thou not that we perish? How canst thou lie asleep? When each moment so madly is threatening, the grave in the angry deep. Shall obey thy will. Whether the wrath of the soul shall see, or demons or men, or whatever it be, no water can swallow the ship where lies the master of ocean and earth and skies. They all shall sweetly obey. Peace be still, peace be still. They all shall sweetly obey thy will. Peace be still. Master, with anguish of spirit, I bow in my grief today. The depth of my sad heart of trouble, awaken and save, I pray. 
torrents of sin and of anguish swept o'er my sinking soul. And I perish, I perish, dear Master, oh, hasten and take control. The winds and the waves shall obey thy will. Master, the terror is over, the element sweetly rests. Her son in the conflict is mirrored, and heaven's within my breast. Clinger, O oh blessed Redeemer, with me alone no more. And joy I shall make the blessed harbor, and rest on the blissful shore. And the way shall obey thy will. Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by a ship into a distant place far. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities. And Jesus went forward. And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude. moved with compassion toward them and he healed their sick. Really is good to be back with you all and I really truly appreciate Joel stepping in last week and taking I know how difficult those things are when you pull double duty, but I deeply, deeply appreciate it. Well, Northwestern University Wildcats had a losing record in football. A man by the name of Gary Barnett was hired as their head coach to try to get the team turned around. He got there to Northwestern in 1995. He was determined to prove that this team, as small as this school was, could compete in a national championship. So he ordered several Tournament of Roses flags from Pasadena. And he put those flags in the stadium, in the athletes' dormitories, and in his office. And each locker of the football team's members, he placed a silk rose. He kept one 
on his desk. He did this to remind everyone where they were headed. That fall, everyone watched in disbelief as Northwestern upset Notre Dame. And they went on to score that year one upset after another. And they ended up in the Rose Bowl. Now they did lose that game, but not by much. The University of Southern California took that crown that year. But it says something about the power of focus. Our scripture reading, particularly verse 13, Matthew chapter 14. Jesus was having a tough week. If we read the verses prior to this, we see that he lost a friend and a relative, John the Baptist. Herod had him killed. Just prior to that, he was rejected in his hometown's synagogue in Nazareth. Even his own family was ashamed and doubted his messiahship. But it was not hard to understand then why Jesus was having a war week and wanted to get away from the people to be along with God. Jesus needed time to think. He needed time to pray. He needed time to reflect. And he also needed time to grieve. But he couldn't. He couldn't because the crowds kept following him wherever he went. You know, sometimes I think with all of us, no matter what we do, nothing seems to work. When it rains, it pours. And I think every one of us have experienced something like this. And we're going to focus this morning on verses 13 through 33. So allow us to see what Jesus did when he was having a bad week. We'll look at the 5,000. We'll look at the apostles in the boat and Jesus walking on the water. <clears throat> now, if you were finding yourself in a situation like Jesus, trying to get away, and this crowd was following you, what would you do if you were in this situation? Now think about that for just a moment. If it was me, I would probably say, listen, I appreciate you all coming, you know, but I've had a really, really rough week. I just need to get away. I need some time alone. And I'll tell you what I'll do is when I come back, I'll let you all know. And then we can all get together again. You see, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus ministered to those lost. Instead of telling them how much he hurt, he tended to their hurts. You know, we have a tradition at funeral time of providing meals to the family. But instead of the crowd providing and feeding Jesus, Jesus fed them, even though Jesus was mourning. You know, I say it often, and as I was preparing the lesson, it slapped me in the face again. I cannot get over just how self-centered society has got. How much we expect to be served. But Jesus was willing to forget himself and to focus on the interests of others. And after he fed the 5,000, again, he tried to find some solitude. He sends his apostles off in a boat and he goes off to be alone with God. I have another question. Why do you suppose Jesus was in such a hurry to get away? 
And I'll suggest two possibilities. One is that he was trying to set out, trying to do what he set out to do, and that was to be alone. But the other reason had to do with the crowd. See, the crowd gave him a reason that, to leave quickly. They wanted to make him a king. You can't fault the Jews. They have lived, dreamed, prayed, and hoped for the Messiah to come. And that expectation ran extremely high during Jesus' ministry. Now we find this in John's account in John chapter 6, in verses 14 and 15, where it tells us that after the crowd was fed, they began to see that he might be the Messiah. It tells us there that John says that Jesus perceived this, that they would take him away, that they would force him to become a king. And so Jesus left again to a mountain alone. And this brings us to the first point in this morning's lesson. Like Jesus, we must focus on being what God wants us to be. This crowd wanted to make Jesus, Jesus a Messiah King. But they misunderstood Jesus' purpose and his focus in life. Jesus didn't come to deliver them from Roman bondage. He came to deliver them from the bondage of sin. It was not about political salvation. It was about spiritual salvation. These people were trying to make Jesus something that God did not want him to be or do. And that is a decision that we must also make. Who are we going to please? God or the crowd? In Babe Ruth's last baseball season, the umpire called him out on strikes. And Babe Ruth turned around and looked at the umpire and he said, you know, there are 40,000 people in this stadium who would tell you that that pitch was not a strike. And the umpire looked at him and he said, yeah, but my opinion is the only one that counts. Same is with God. His opinion is the only one that counts. Jesus is what he is to us this morning because it was God that Jesus wanted to please. And it was God's opinion that Jesus valued the most. I sound like a broken record sometimes, but I can't help myself. It is so important that we find the time each day to be alone with God. Away from all the distractions, no TV, no radio, no phones, no kids, no spouse, just God. If Jesus couldn't go through life without spending time alone with God, what makes you think we can? Jesus spent time with God not just because he wanted to, but because he needed to. In Hebrews 4 and verse 15, the Hebrew writer tells us that Jesus was tempted in all points, just like we were. Now, to me, that means that Jesus was tempted to be and to do something that God never intended for him to be or to do. Just like us. So Jesus needed to spend time alone with God in order to maintain his focus. 
our focus is to be and to do what God wants us to be and to do. And in order to maintain our focus, we need to spend time alone with God. Point two. In order to maintain our focus, we need to look for and to see Christ in the storms of life. And we need to expect God to do some unbelievable things in our lives. Let's look at the narrative starting in verse 22 of Matthew 14 through verse 33. We're not going to read them. But we'll look at them and you can follow along in your Bibles as you will. The apostles, they get into a boat and they start across the Sea of Galilee just as Jesus had commanded them. And they get out into the middle of the lake and they encounter a storm. And this is not your run-of-the-mill storm because some of them were fishermen. They've probably been in storms all the time. But it says in the Bible that the wind was against them. At this point in the lake from Genesaret to the other side is about four miles. They should have been there long before midnight. But the Bible says that in the fourth hour, fourth watch of the night, about three to six o'clock in the morning, they're still battling this storm. How many of us have gotten into the boat as Jesus has commanded? How many of us are conscientiously working our way across the sea of life? How many of us are encountering some storm in our lives? <clears throat> Romans 5, verses 3 and 4, Paul writes here, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. In James chapter 1 and verses 2 through 5, this is hard for me. I, I, can't, I can't grasp this at all. When James says, count it pure joy, pure joy. When we face trials of many kinds, the King James says, divers temptations. He tells us that the testing of our faith produces perseverance. And he goes on to say in those verses that when perseverance has finished its work, that we become mature, that we become complete, that spiritually we will lack nothing. And 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 6 through 9 tells us that the storms of life refine us. It remakes us. It remolds us into what God wants us to do. <clears throat> Friends, here's a truth. A hard truth. A hard truth that sometimes breaks the back of Christians. We can be totally committed to God and still be subjected to the storms of life. Nothing in our life on this earth will ever be smooth sailing. Nothing. In 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, Paul said, All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. In the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, Blessed are they who are persecuted, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, we might not be politically persecuted yet. And maybe we're not even being persecuted by our neighbors. But I'm here to tell you that Satan has got a hold of our coattails and he persecutes us every day. We try to make that step forward and he's yanking our coattails back. He does not want us to succeed. And he is going to throw everything he can in that storm of life to break our back. To sink our ship. Whether we choose to believe it or not, 
many of us here this morning are in the boat. We've obeyed the gospel. We've been baptized into Christ. We are committed to him, and yet some of us are probably suffering in a storm. The question is, can we see Christ in our storm? These storms may be God's way of correcting us. Maybe it is God's way of telling us to reconsider the direction in some particular area of our lives. As his children, maybe we are being corrected. But whatever storm we are facing, Whatever storm we may face, Jesus is saying, don't be afraid. It is I. I am walking with you in this storm. Regardless of what we will face, God will not let us do it alone. If any of our children were suffering, would we let them do it alone? No. We'd be right there with them. If they were in the hospital, we'd be there by their side, chair pulled up next to the bed, our hand holding theirs, till whenever. When they're sick at home, they'd be laying in our laps, and we'd keep them there, not letting them suffer alone. We must also believe that God will not let us suffer alone. We also need to expect God to do unbelievable things in our lives. I don't know what the apostles were expecting that night. But the one thing I do know is they weren't expecting Jesus. They weren't expecting to see him walking on that walk. He left and he went up on the mountain. He's nowhere around here. Here he comes. And he's not just walking on the water. He's walking on the same water that's threatening to swamp their boat. These men didn't know what to think. Looked like Jesus. They walked like Jesus. But was it Jesus or was it a ghost? That storm was impeding their progress. It was rocking their boat. It was threatening their lives. But it is this storm that is bringing them to Christ. It is the bridge from them to salvation. Could it be true for us too? There's probably some sitting here this morning who saw God in a storm. And that was the bridge that brought them to Christ. The focus of the apostles was inhibited for two reasons. One, like us, they were not looking for Jesus in the storm. And two, is that the storm that is actually threatening their lives is actually the storm that is bringing them to Jesus. It is the bridge that brought them to Christ. Friends, we must have faith that God will do unbelievable things in our lives. I want to notice verse 26 of Matthew 14. Seeing Jesus doing such an unbelievable thing frightened the apostles. But you know, this is not something that is new. The shepherds were afraid when the angels announced 
the unbelievable birth of Jesus. After the miraculous catch of Peter and them, Jesus said, Fear not, I will make you fishers of men. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus calms the storm with just three words. Peace, be still. Mark says that the apostles were terrified. And they asked, who is that? Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey? Sometimes when God does some unbelievable things in our lives, we become fearful. We become fearful because we don't expect it. In our mind, we know we can walk on water. We know in our minds that he can do unbelievable things. But sometimes, in spite of us, we don't believe it in our hearts. And we certainly don't expect it. At the end of this narrative, when Jesus gets into the boat, the apostles, the disciples there, confess that Jesus is the Son of God. When God answers our prayer, when he forgives our sins, when he heals our broken relationships, when he lifts us up from the hard times and heals our body. When God empowers us and enables us to carry out his commands in our lives by making us better Christians. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid rather acknowledge that he is who he says he is. The storms of life can be a bridge that leads us to God and brings us to Christ. Where do you stand this morning? Is there a bridge for you this morning? Where will we be in the day of the Lord when he returns and we're standing in a line and we see a separation? Goats to one side, sheep to the other. Which group will we be placed in? This morning, if you're not a Christian, I can show you how to be on the side of the sheep. You're here because you believe. You're here because there is faith there. But is your faith strong enough this morning to lead you to that decision to repent, to confess, and to be baptized for the remission of sins. Maybe you don't quite understand it all and need some guidance. We would be willing to study with you at that point to help you in your understanding of what needs to be done in obeying the gospel. That is your decision this morning. To obey the gospel, to put on your Lord and Savior in baptism, we want you to do that as quickly as possible. If you are a child of God, if you've been in that boat, if you are in that boat, maybe you haven't done the things you need and the storms of life are just wearing you down. You finally realize that I'm not getting in the boat and staying in the boat like I should be. I need to be remolded, remade. I need to realize what God wants me to be and wants me to do. You can change that also this morning.
If there's anyone that has a need, won't you come as together we stand and we sing? <laughs> There's a line that is drawn by rejecting our Lord, where the call of His Spirit is lost, and you hurry along with a pleasure-mad throng, and you count. earth. We're thankful for the opportunity we've had to come together and worship Thee on just the first day of the week. We pray that all that's been said and done has been found pleasing to Thee. We can gain much by just simply being here. We pray that we will 
work on our focus, allow you to be the center of that focus, even though it's hard each and every day to do that. We just pray that we can work each and every day to make you that center of our life. There are so many that are in need of our prayers. I pray that you'll just continue to be with those that are sick, the ones that are shut-ins, the folks that will be having tests and procedures upcoming. I pray that you'll just be with those that may be struggling or, or lost at this time. I pray that you'll be with them and be with all those that attend to these folks. We pray that you'll give them the strength and the comfort and the guidance that's needed see to them. Continue to be with those that just protect us each and every day in whatever capacity that might be. We pray that you'll be with them, be with their families, and also strengthen and comfort them and guide them. We pray that they can be reunited with their families soon once again. Just continue to be with us all as we Leave this place, you'll keep us safe, and we pray that you'll forgive us when we fail you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.